Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Now let's continue with that consistent fault line in the United States race. And the context, of course, is the verdict of guilt handed down on Tuesday on three separate charges against the white former police officer Derek Chauvin, convicted of the murder of the African-American George Floyd. For many observers around the world, in a wider sense, it wasn't just Derek Chauvin who was on trial. Police brutality in America and beyond in Europe, Africa and elsewhere was on trial and whether the criminal justice system would live up to its name was also on trial. Black people dying at the hands of the police is a narrative of people of African origin, uh, one that they're familiar with and fearful of in many parts of the world, and successful prosecutions have been rare. The case of George Floyd seemed an open and shut one, but of course little connected to issues of race and ethnicity anywhere in the world ever are. The jury in Minnesota found former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin guilty on all counts in the murder of George Floyd last May. It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the Vice President just referred to. The systemic racism is a Stain on our nation's soul, <clears throat> the knee on the neck of justice for black Americans, profound fear and trauma, the pain, the exhaustion that black and brown Americans experience every single day. Today's verdict is a step forward. I just spoke with the governor of Minnesota, who thanked me for the close work with his team. And I also spoke with George Floyd's family again. Remarkable family of extraordinary courage. Nothing can ever bring their brother, their father back. But this can be a giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. Let's also be clear that such a verdict is also much too rare for so many people it seems like it took a unique and extraordinary convergence of factors. A brave young woman with a smartphone camera, a crowd that was traumatized, traumatized witnesses, a murder that lasts almost 10 minutes in broad daylight for ultimately the whole world to see. Most men and women who wear the badge serve their communities honorably. But those few who failed to meet that standard must be held accountable, and they were today. One was. No one should be above the law. And today's verdict sends that message. But That's uh, President Biden there speaking after the verdict and saying the time had come for meaningful police reform in America. Well, to continue our discussion of the significance of this conviction and to get a sense of its global ramifications, I'm joined now from Accra, Ghana by Kojo Annan, African entrepreneur, social reformer and son of the late UN Secretary General Kofi Anan, absolutely delighted to have you on the program, Kojo. Thank you for joining us. Uh, give us your reaction to this verdict. Certainly the weight of anticipation waiting for the verdict to come in has been heavy, hasn't it? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of anticipation. Um, there's, a, there's a major sense of relief for the, for the guilty verdict and the fact that um, rightfully so, you know, Chauvin will be held accountable for his gruesome and terrifying acts and um, a broader message to the um, police force at large in the US that they have to be accountable for their actions. But I believe there's also, um, I think I heard a quote from the great tennis player, Naomi Osaka, who basically said, there is um, a sense of disappointment and sadness that we're all rejoicing over a verdict of a murder that we all watched on camera. Um, and I think that's of great 
concern that it took this much scrutiny and global attention for the rightful verdict. And I think the, the bigger question is, you know, what, what happens next? Um, I think since, since George Floyd's murder, there's about 70-something um, African-Americans or people of color that have since um, been killed or um, maimed by the police. And I think this is the, the larger issue that has to be tackled. And the question is, where do we go from here? It's definitely a step in the, the right direction, but the, the journey ahead is very long. That's a very good point that you raise there. Relief and gratitude for a guilty verdict, but also pain that it took America and the world, in fact, seeing a black man killed at the hands of police for this type of verdict to come in. Correct. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we all saw, as, as, as President Biden himself just, just testified, we all saw the the knee on the neck for almost 10 minutes, I believe, nine minutes, and it shouldn't really. The fact that we've all held our collective breath is, is the real testament as to the concern and, and the problems with the current um, justice system and police brutality in the US. And um, as an African and as a black person, I think it concerns us all because um, that could be me, that could be you, that could be our families, it could be anybody that we know that would simply be manhandled, attacked, murdered, um, simply because of the color of their skin and, and not given their due justice and recourse. And, I mean, you are, of course, in Accra, Ghana. You've been following this case. Um, you've been in different parts of the world. Would you say that this reckoning is not only a verdict on Derek Chauvin or on police forces in America, but some have suggested that it's also a verdict on police forces around the world, in Africa, Europe, and elsewhere, in Nigeria, with the NSARS protests and beyond? Um, yeah, well, I, I'm not sure if it's a verdict on the police forces around the world. Um, if we use Nigeria as a case in point, I'm, I'm also, I'm from Ghana, but I'm also half Nigerian. My mother's Nigerian, um, and I followed NSARS very closely. Um, a lot of my family lives in Lagos. I, I lived there for many years. I don't think the two cases are directly related. I think, hopefully, the government and the police authorities in Nigeria are taking note and paying attention, but I can't say that I believe there's a direct correlation and the, the verdict in the U.S. will have a direct effect on NSARS and any forms of police brutality in Nigeria, for example. I think, unfortunately, or fortunately, each jurisdiction or countries um, handle their police system differently, and certainly Nigeria and, and America operate very different systems. Well, of course, returning specifically to America, th this verdict also goes beyond the police uh, and speaks to the depths of racism in that country, which do not exist only within the criminal justice system, but within every system across the U.S. The economy, housing, you know, banking and education and health. Is this likely to lead to the deep work of wrestling with them and undoing that racism from your observation perch um yeah i think from from my perspective it's certainly a step in the right direction i think with the year with the incredible year that we had last year in 2020 and actually spilling over into 2021 you first had um obviously the global COVID pandemic which i'm sure we'll be talking a bit more about later and then of course, you had um, the whole Black Lives Matter um, global awakening on the back of George Floyd. And then, of course, the um, U.S. Um, presidential election with um, former President Trump against President Biden. Um, I think that whole process and the fact that everybody was was at home during the corona crisis, you know, allowed a major moment of introspection. I think... Um, as you rightfully said, the racism in America is rife and so deeply ingrained that it's going to take a lengthy process for change. But my hope and optimism lies firmly with the next generation. I think 
a lot of the racism is uh, more tied to the older generation. Don't get me wrong, I'm not being naive that the racism doesn't cross the board, but I think the hope is with the younger generation who also are needed to sort of unlift this veil within their own families, that the white youth are, are the ones who can take on their own parents, grandparents, and just let them realize that until we have racial equity, there will simply not be justice and peace applied because Black Lives Matter have opened everyone's eyes to the extent that I don't think this is going anywhere. And finally, once and for all, um, black people in America, and not just in America, globally, want justice and more rightfully, they want equity. Equity across the board, as you said, whether it's in education, housing, finance, et cetera, et cetera, and police, um, the treatment by police. We want equity across the board. Um, the days of, of white supremacy and racial bias are simply no longer acceptable. And I think it's going to take a generational change for that to act. The steps are being taken and we remain hopeful. Right. And you talked about the moment of introspection there. And, and um, that, that's an important point you raised because, I mean, that appeared to help people to see the most galling thing about this which was the way officer derek chauvin was bold and brazen to not only take the life of another man but to do so callously with his hands in his pockets while watching it being filmed I mean, in effect he trusted the system to to work on his behalf but but this time perhaps for the first time he was wrong i mean the system failed to work on, on his behalf, uh, that a black man's life was not protected on that day, but it was honored on Tuesday in court by making Derek Chauvin go to jail. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I mean, I lived many years myself in New York and the US. I've got many friends there and they've all told me consistently and repeatedly the Kojo that, um, that Kojo, listen, this racism has been going on from time immemorial. It's just that now we have more cameras, smartphones, and case in point, as we saw with the George Floyd case, and if that brave young lady wasn't there filming and um, played the film for the whole world to see, George Chauvin would probably have been let off. You could even see a sense of surprise um, on his face yesterday when the guilty verdict was announced and he was cuffed and taken away to, to prison. And it's this, it's this sense of impunity um, and lack of justice for black people that, that is really, really, really shocking and deeply concerning to all, all of us. And even though we've seen it and we were aware of, of the racism in America, to, to actually watch it pan out and to watch, as you said, this police officer who in theory is supposed to be protecting the lives of the citizens to sit there callously and take every last breath from another human being without fear of recourse or any consideration for, for the, another man's life is what is most deeply shocking to us. And I think finally, many people who are not black and white Americans and people of other colors, um, white people from all over the, the world were also shocked by what we all saw. And this is just thanks to technology and smartphones, et cetera, that are taking the, the wool off people's eyes and showing us what has actually very tragically been happening in America for decades and decades and decades and continues to happen. And hopefully this is the start of progress in the right direction. Okay, Kojo, do stay with us. We'll want to talk to you a bit more about the other things that you're doing. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with Kojo Annan, African entrepreneur, social reformer, and son of the late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Zenia Golden. Now, my guest, Kojo Annan, is an African entrepreneur and social reformer who founded Africa 10 in 2016, a social enterprise focusing on the development of African youth through sports and education. He also recently co founded a $300 million health tech fund for pandemic protection and preparedness. Mr. Annan has consistently called for vaccinations to be spread quickly around the world and for it to be followed up with technology equality in healthcare and climate change. Mr. Annan has been a keynote speaker at the World Economic Forum in Davos and the United Nations General Assembly, where he's been calling for policies to create a more just, peaceful and sustainable world. And last but not least, Kojo Annan is, of course, the son of the late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. And Kojo Annan is still with me on the line from Accra, Ghana. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Uh, tell us more about what you've been calling for uh, with regard to the proposals for an international pandemic treaty. It was a major eye-opener for, for all of us here. Um, in some regards, we did very well in terms of compared to the expectations that many media or global media were espousing or projecting for the region but it's clear that there was a there's a huge divide with the rollout of vaccines um it's um very concerning to me that um right now most of our countries rely strictly on what grants what we're handed through the um covax platform and that's not in any way a criticism of covax i think it's a fantastic platform and it's done very well for many countries to already both where I am in Ghana, also in Nigeria, people, you know, vaccines have been rolling. I can testify many people I know have already had their vaccine. But um, my concern is around the, the disparity of vaccine rollouts, whereby the, the first world or the, the developed countries with larger um, checkbooks and um, um, treasuries are able to scramble for, for vaccines um, and, of course, focus on their citizens, which is which is natural, but to the detriment of the rest of the world. It's, you know, it's simply unacceptable when some countries have had 200 million vaccines and others are struggling to get up to half a million or, or a million. And this, this kind of inequality is simply not serving the world at large. And with COVID, if anything, should have taught us the need for an interdependent um, global society, particularly when it comes to pandemics and health care, because it's very clear that you can sit in your country and vaccinate everybody. But if others come in from outside, from other regions, from Africa, from India, from Asia, um, then your citizens are not safe. So clearly it should be in the global interest to protect everyone we're not all safe until everybody is safe and i think that was the sort of ethos and thinking behind what i was saying and based on the statistics and results we've seen so far in the vaccine rollout and of course um a few weeks ago we saw the scramble in europe countries fighting amongst themselves for vaccine we've seen recent developments in india where one moment vaccines are being rolled out next moment they're not because of course they have their own crisis with their own citizens so until there's some kind of uniformity and a global system that, that cares let's just move on you, you recently co-founded a health tech fund for what's been described as pandemic protection and, and preparedness um i presume that's linked to the issues that you just raised um how is that supposed to work yeah correct i mean i think um Myself and a few partners set up a, a, a health tech fund focused on the um, disruptive health technologies, essentially around the ethos and um, broader thinking that we've all learned from COVID that we clearly need to, across the board, increase our investments in health cares. When we look across many countries globally, if we just look about the amount of money that's going into defense, or many other sectors, as opposed to healthcare, <clears throat> and COVID very much drove home the point to all of us that health is the number one priority for every citizen, because without health and 
what do we have? So our focus as a fund, together with my partners, is to invest in disruptive health technologies that would allow us to be ahead of pandemics such as this and future pandemics, because now I think we've all listened to the scientists to know that A, the world knew that such a pandemic was coming, but didn't do anything about it or didn't prepare um, properly. And furthermore, we know that according to the statistics and the studies and research, there's future pandemics coming for years to come. So our vision is that we need to invest in health, tech, research, design, development, so that we are ahead of future pandemics and protect ourselves, our families, our citizens, as opposed to the to the reactionary system that we saw from COVID and the widespread devastation, loss of lives and suffering that, that, we, that was the result of lack of preparedness. Um, so that is the basis on which we have set up the pandemic fund. It's not just focused on, on this current COVID pandemic, it's focused on future pandemics and the broader healthcare space in general. Well, that, that's a that's a good move, and uh, I, I hope that that is one that that can be sustained in, in the long sort of term. But I mean, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to go, and I absolutely will not let you go it, it, f before we talk for a moment about the towering figure that your father was, the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who is seen by many as a truly great man, but presumably by you as just your dad. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you just hit the nail on the head, just like everybody else. He was my dad. And of course, he became Secretary General of the UN and, and a global figure. But like many young children, he was my first hero, grew up, whether it's playing sports or running around or helping me with my school, probably similar to what I try and do with my son. Um, and then, of course, he became a, a globally respected statesman and um, a, a model, I hope, for many people around the world and particularly many Africans as well to, to emulate as a model of decency, integrity, um, honor, and carry himself with a, with, with a great sense of nobility. But he had um, deep convictions in right and wrong and i'm sure if he was here today he would also be emphasizing this need for um for global equity in the vaccination rollouts and in preparing ourselves and working as an interdependent world because he was always focused on commonality as opposed to differences and bridging that divide for a fairer safer and more peaceful world well, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, there's certainly no question that, that your father, Kofi Annan, was a hugely respected figure across Africa and the world. And um, his passing was a loss, uh, not just for you, but, but also for all of us who have connections to Africa. I want to thank you very much indeed, uh, Kojo Annan, for taking the time to talk to us uh, from Accra, Ghana. Kojo Annan is an African entrepreneur, social reformer, and son of the late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Uh, thank you very much indeed. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja, Ghana, and the United States. Bye-bye, and thank you for watching.